Today's talk is called, I'm here. Now I'm here. Now I'm here. Now this may be one of the most difficult concepts ever to take a hold of. Because here's the thing. I'm here. And it doesn't mean anything. And I can't define it. Nor should I define it. I'm here. I'm here. And there is no satisfying definition for here. There is nothing that's quite enough. Because if I label here, I guarantee you I'm going to want to be there. No matter how good here is or feels, uh, there's better there. Oh, finally, I got here, but I want to be there now. Uh, you know, I grew up with one of those mothers that said, oh, you, oh good, you got a B. Now when you get an A, it's like, well, what, what happened to the celebration for the B? Could I celebrate here? I get it. Here may not be where I imagined there was years ago. <laughs> when I set out on my journey years ago, uh, actually, my, my here is better than ever. <laughs> better than I had imagined. It really is. Better than I believed it could be. But for many of us, I know, we had another vision. And it's it, here is not that vision manifested. But... How do I allow here to be good and here to be good? It's not about my physical body. It's about my relationship with God or spirit. It's about my relationship with love. It's about my relationship with wisdom. It's about my relationship with that which is never going to change. Love is never going to change. Only my experience of it and my understanding of it will change. But love itself is just love. And uh, God itself is God. Law is always going to be law. And so if I'm here, and I don't like here, I need to go into, under, get understanding of law and principle in order to become okay, at the very least, okay with here. It is, it is the only path to experience joy while I'm here. To experience love while I'm here. Because otherwise I'm always going to be trying to get there. Oh, there's going to be good. There is going to be so good when I get there. Oh, and I'm never going to get there. And I, I know it because I've tried so hard to get there. And, and it's just, there is no there there. So it tells me I have got to get here in mind, body, and spirit. I've got to align them while I'm here. And as long as I keep trying to say, but the pet journey here was bad. The journey to get me here shouldn't have happened that way. I'm set, setting myself up for misery while I'm here. So I'm here. And now I'm here. And now I'm here. But I'm always here. What's the greatest source of suffering? Being here and wanting to be there. And not knowing how to get there. I can't, there is no there. There is only here. I am here imagining what there looks like and feels like. But I'm still here doing it. I'm always here. And I think we often forget to go within and ask what here really means. To go within and ask, with the assumption that there is good here. And it is I who must become willing to recognize it as it is shown to me. And through my, my daily journaling practice, I, I get a lot of insights into how the good is here. Still can't define the good because I will limit it if I do that. But I can see hope and possibility in the, oh, here. And I, I will ask Spirit, show me how to see. Show me the truth in all beings. 
show me the truth in myself. You know, I, I have a certain dissatisfaction with my body, hard as it may be to believe, but I, I have found a flaw or two in my physical being. And, and still I have to say, Spirit, tell me the truth about my body so that I don't hate my body. So that I don't tell myself a story that is untrue. Because I have caught myself in the past several years telling myself a lot of stories that cannot be true in God. They can be true in this uh, confusion, but they cannot be true in God. And I, you know, when I started my healing 20 some years ago, I, I would pray and say, okay, I need to see, I need to see, I need to see, because otherwise I'm just gonna be in a living hell. And I've already been in a living hell and I don't want to continue in a living hell. And I am promised a pathway out of the living hell. I am promised by my teachers. I am promised, and I'm here to promise you, there is a way out. If I am your teacher, if I, listen to me, pay attention. If I'm not, ignore me. Don't make noise, but ignore me. <laughs> Don't be a distraction. But if I am your teacher, I am here to promise you, there is a path, way out of a living hell. But you're gonna have to give up. Your misery, you're going to, have to give up your lack. You're going to, have to give up your conversations that proclaim the absence of good. So years ago, I, start, I took on new conversations about the absence of good and convinced myself that there was an absence of good and began to shame others and myself and try to inflict guilt and, and take on guilt. And I've been wrong in truth, in spirit. Truth has no need for me to be guilty or ashamed or embarrassed. Principle and law have no need for me to be ashamed or embarrassed or guilty. Nowhere do I see that the pathway into the kingdom of heaven is through guilt. Not in my Bible. And not in my books. And I want to take it out of my story. I don't want my story any longer to be that I could be redeemed through guilt. No, if I want redemption, and I usually use that word, it's an old term, but the absence of redemption is my own definition of suffering. It's me telling myself I should suffer, I should be in guilt, I should be whatever. That is the, the absence of good in God. No, no, no. Redemption is the releasing of that story and the pursuing the still small voice that will tell me how I am loved and how I may love my fellow beings. This week, I, I worked my, well, I, it's a term, but it's a wrong term. I'm trying to think, but right now I'll use it. I worked my brains out these past two weeks. I mean, we worked long, long hours, harder than I've worked in a long time to do this process, because they're, they're understaffed at Unity Village and things, and, at, or Unity School, U Unity Worldwide Ministries. They're understaffed to put this whole education thing together, and it's only two years old, because Unity School stopped being Unity School and just went to being Unity Village and Unity, Worldwide Headqu Unity World Headquarters and Silent Unity. Unity Worldwide Ministries took over the school two years ago, and they've done a phenomenal job, but it's still two, two years old, and it is flawed, as any program is when it's starting, and it's still amazing what we've accomplished in two years. And, and so I was willing to put in long, hard days, but I never woke up one day unhappy in the past two weeks. And I slept well every single night, which I don't always do when I'm awake. And so I know that we were doing the right things and I was showing up. So I didn't complain about the long, hard days much. And I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what I, I, sure I did, but I didn't say they shouldn't be happening. It was just arg, <laughs> arg, arg, this hurts, this is. Oof, we were so relieved to get out to dinner in the evening and realize, oh, it's, it's 8 o'clock. I don't have anything till 8.30 tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> 
and they're off in a bed by 9 30 at night and grateful to be with one another all of us on our team there were no fights there were no strong disagreements there was always looking for the spiritual solution we are not angels these other ministers and myself we were just having a good time doing something that was productive we didn't get paid anything extra for it you guys this church donates me to Unity Village to do this work, to strengthen the unity movement. It comes out of our, our church tithe to send me there to do this work. In case you didn't know, now you know. And it's, it's such rewarding work because yeah, when I went through the program, it was not a kind program, it was not a generous program uh, because the people, I'll call them ministers, <coughs> were not equipped to minister to other ministers. Maybe they do fine in their churches. I don't know. I've never been to their churches. I'm not planning to go. Uh, but because of what I went through, and I'll use the word cruelty that was shown to many of us back then, a year later, I became a mentor. Two years later, I joined the, the policy team, and within three years, I was chair of it. And my goal, my mission, was to create a loving, kinder, gentler program for incoming ministers. To realize, oh, we're already doing the work. We're already peers here. We are not here to look down on anyone as if they are not as good as me. There are roles that we must maintain because I do have a certain authority, but it's not that I'm better than them. It's just, this is what the role is. It's like, if you, if you have a job, anybody? <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, was, that, was that resistance? <laughs> you don't really have a boss. You have a supervisor, but you guys are equal in that you're there for the mission of the company. You are there working alongside others and each of you have a role and one is not superior to the other in spirituality it may be that one has more authority but if you're doing your job you don't have anything to worry about unless you decide you do hmm. unless you decide well they could fire me mm, only if you decide that really treat them as a spiritual equal treat your supervisors as spiritual I don't, I don't mean preach to them but you look at them in love and joy and wisdom many many uh, an employee has uh, transformed a relationship between the supervisor and the employee through love through a kind word through, but as long as you're holding the thought I better be careful because they might fire me. They're not your parents. And they are not God. We're here as co-workers with different titles, with different responsibilities. And when we get, begin to look at that, we are set free. We are so set free. When I worked at Don't Tell Mama, it never occurred to me to worry about what my employer thought of me unless I wasn't doing my job, unless I was trying to get away with not doing, living up to my commitment. It's only when we're trying to get away with something that we have to worry mostly about getting caught. <laughs> and that's kind of like life, isn't it? You know, I don't have to fear the police if I'm not, if I'm driving at the speed limit. But if I'm trying to get away with stuff down the highway, if I'm trying to get away with robbing a bank, if I'm trying to get away with uh, crime, then odds are I'm going to be looking over my shoulder for somebody to catch me. And then we get into relationships, many of us, and we turn each other into our parents. And we're here trying to get there in the relationship and trying to get there in the relationship. And it never works because we have turned each other into an authority figure. And neither of us has any authority over the other. 
I forget, oh, I have choices. I have choices on how to love. I, I told you the story about a couple of few months ago when I, uh, I, I went to open the refrigerator and there was Schmutz on the refrigerator door. And I was so angry at David over that in the past. On this day, I wanted to cry because I saw for uh, close to 17 years, I'd been telling myself I'm not loved because of Schmutz on the refrigerator door because of crumbs on a counter. Well, I, I don't want to tell myself I'm not loved anymore. So with that, I have to say, oh, wipe the refrigerator off yourself, Sean, if you don't like schmutz on it. Because I don't want to make him bad anymore. I, yeah, thank you. I, uh, she said I'm so good. And, oh, he's so good, too. Yes, he is. But I don't want him to not be good in my mind because of a sticky door handle because of things, and I don't want to not be good in my mind because of something he doesn't like that I do. I can't control his mind. I can't decide whether he thinks I'm good or not, or what he thinks about himself because of what he thinks about me. But I can control what I think about myself and my own self-esteem and my own self-love and it doesn't give me free reign to be unkind. It doesn't give me free reign to hurt another carelessly or intentionally. But for my own humanity, and I've got plenty of it, I don't have to hate myself anymore over whether or not he likes it, or if it rubs him the wrong way. I have to begin to look at it and say, oh, is that something about myself I ought to change because it's the right thing to do because it blocks my spirituality. But to say, oh, no, I better not do that because he'll be upset and then he'll be mad at me and then I won't be a worthwhile human being. Anybody ever done that in a relationship? Mm -hmm. You treat yourself like, oh, no, if I make them mad, then I, uh, I won't be valid. I won't be valuable. That's how I grew up. Afraid of upsetting my mother. And then I was afraid of upsetting teachers. And then I was afraid of upsetting employers. And then I got afraid of upsetting lots of people. The world, basically. Because I was afraid of losing my value. But my value is my spirit self. So you see, I'm still here. I'm always going to be here. Except when I'm here. But it's still here. And then I'm here. And of course, this is still here. And so, to look at life, and you know, oh, I am good where I am. And then to look at my neighbor, my relationship, my friends, and say, oh, and you're here. You're not there, you're here. But if I keep trying to get you to be there, well, we both miss out on our spirit selves. We both miss out. I'm not saying we're not going to have feelings, and boy, I wish it would uh, feel different. But for, for it to feel different, I have to see it differently from here. And that means I go within and say, okay, Spirit, show me. Show me what this is. Show me what to think. If I didn't like my job, I need to pray and say, Spirit, show me my job. Show me what it is. Because a lot of times we'll just start to hate our jobs because we're so uncomfortable in our skin. There was a time I was, I, you know, every time I got really uncomfortable, I'd go join another 12-step fellowship. Oh, I shouldn't be uncomfortable. I shouldn't feel this. But I do. Maybe could I just sit still with it for a minute? Could I just sit still with my discomfort for a minute? I don't think, oh, I've got to join a club. I've got to go find something to fix this. Because I was broken all the time. Every time I was uncomfortable. Every time I ate too much or smoked too much or did something. Oh, I'm bad. And, I, I, and it's like, no, I'm not bad. I just have to learn how to deal with discomfort. I have to learn how to be present and pray through times of discomfort. When I had 50, no, I had 19 days of sobriety. And I went to a Saturday night meeting. And I, and I knew I was done with drinking. And I remember hearing this guy say he had 58 days 
And I thought, I will never make it. And I didn't think I would drink. I thought my head would explode before I would get. I, I thought my body will implode upon itself before I ever get to 58 days without a drink. I didn't go through much physical withdrawal. I went through mental and emotional withdrawal. And I was so uncomfortable. But I kept wanting to find out who I would be if I waited one more day. And then a year and a half later when I quit smoking, it's like, oh, oh my goodness, because I really, I was 11 when I started that. And I every day I was like, who will I be if I don't? And 20 some years later, I still want to know who will I be? If I don't drink or smoke anymore, and, and so I'm, you know, I haven't gotten to that with the with the with the sweets, and that's okay because I don't want to be bad, because I weigh more than I want to weigh, and I don't I don't fat shame anybody. It's just as I said, it's hard on the knees. Uh, it, but it's it's I don't want to make us unlovable anymore, because of our humanity. I want it to be safe for me to be here. Right here. I want it to be safe. <clears throat> Mentally, emotionally. And that if somebody doesn't like it that I'm here, but I know I'm not doing anything wrong, to quietly say, no. Let your yeses be yes and your noes be no. It's like the, the story David and I have about this. Our, a friend of ours, a little girl, in San Francisco, her granddaughter, and she, I may tell it wrong, let me, uh, she climbed, she, she, and they have very high toilets. And she climbed up on this toilet and she declared, no toilet is too big for me. <laughs> and then she said, oh, I just love myself. <laughs> There's no toilet high too high for us. <laughs> Let me read this. This goes from the Holy Spirit's interpretation of the New Testament. The book of Acts, chapter 7, chapter verse 6, 9. And it says, The path that you walk with me will have steps that are necessary to your learning. You may not understand each step as it seems to come upon you, but do not let the steps confuse you. If you become lost in your confusion, trying to solve things on your own, you are not learning your lesson and you cannot advance on the path. Although the form of each lesson may seem to change, the lesson is always the same. Let go of any fear that would guide you to take matters into your own hands. Lay aside the illusory will that you do not want. Trust in your worth and in spirit. And ask for the will of spirit. For in my will, you will recognize your will. Through these lessons, the merging of what seems separate will occur into what clearly is and has always been one. Although you may wish that one lesson would suffice in order to accomplish the inevitable fully, it will probably take more and it will most likely take many. This is because your mind is split and not fully ready to learn this lesson as yet. And so each lesson is a stepping stone to the final lesson, the lesson that will end all lessons. Enjoy your journey by realizing its purpose and by celebrating the progress that is made. So, to become safe in this moment. In your bulletin, I gave you this. This is the expanded version of the prayer for protection. We usually just say this much. But to be safe here, now, today, this beginning of our journey, because each day is the beginning of our journey. 
And Mr. Freeman says, the light of God surrounds us, the love of God enfolds us, the power of God protects us, the presence of God watches over us, the mind of God guides us, the life of God flows through us, the, life, the power of God abides in us, the joy of God uplifts us, the strength of God renews us, the beauty of God inspires us, wherever we are, God is, and all is well. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. Wherever. And so here in this moment is not the middle. It's the beginning of the next part of our spiritual journey. Thank you.